Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this week we are doing the top 10 campaigns that hurt crowdfunding. This is going to be a uh, slightly pessimistic video. This is a video about some of the failures in the crowdfunding space, games and or companies that have, well, frankly, hurt crowdfunding, that have made it so that the next person coming along is that much less likely to think twice before they back something. Now, I call it top 10 games that hurt crowdfunding, but in most cases, if there's a company, I kind of bundled all their games together in one conversation. So it's games and or companies that hurt crowdfunding. Sometimes the game is, sometimes the game is more noteworthy, noteworthy. Sometimes the company is more noteworthy. Either way, we'll go ahead and dive into this and before I do go ahead and pause this video well wait till I finish the sentence then pause this video and then go ahead and put down in the comments down below which games and or companies you think have been the biggest detriment to uh, consumer confidence in the crowdfunding space. I think there's some uh, things that we will likely universally agree on, and then there's likely some that I didn't think of and I missed, and I'm curious what those are, and then there's probably a bunch in this video that didn't come to your mind, and that's why these videos are fun. They're a fun little back and forth conversation around, I mean, this one's more pessimistic and depressing, but also the harsh reality is that some of these more pessimistic and depressing videos tend to be slightly more interesting, even though they are more pessimistic and depressing. The good news is you have plenty of games on your table, on your shelves to keep you busy while you, um, wonder which of these are still showing up because some of them may still show up and some of these are likely never going to be seen again. I'll also note before we dive into these, please keep in mind, most of these links are Kickstarter links, but this is not a Kickstarter conversation. This is a crowdfunding conversation. Uh, the very first one we're going to be diving into is a GameFound link. And I, I say that because disclaimer as usual that I'm CMO of GameFound. This is not in any way an anti-Kickstarter video. It is a conversation around critical stuff and crowdfunding. And even though there's only one of these links is actually directly GameFound, some of these, as we'll go through it, definitely have the own attachments. This is not meant to be a platform conversation so much as a crowdfunding conversation. But with that said, let's go and start off with our number 10. Our number 10 is Robinson Crusoe Collector's Edition. It's worth noting that I do have these ranked in order of the least to most problematic in terms of the possible impact they've had on backer confidence. And the first two of these are not about games that aren't delivering so much as games that just had massively long delays. And that's the case with Robinson Crusoe Collector's Edition. In fact, the first two of these are games that I actually literally have in this room right now, and I could go, well, one of them's in this room, but I own two of these games, and they could go ahead and put them on the table because they finally did show up. So less of a problem than games that don't show up at all, but Robinson Crusoe Collector's Edition from Portal Games took way, way longer than people expected, way longer than they should have taken, especially considering this one in particular. This was a reprint, uh, so it's like, I mean, a deluxification to an extent. There is new content, there's new things, but it's a game that already existed for the most part, and it took a massively long time, leaving 17,000 people, 17,000 backers, and I wonder if that's actually including Late Pledge or not, I don't know. But that's 17,000 people who backed this game who were looking forward to it arriving significantly sooner than it actually did. 17,000 people who ended up being significantly more upset. Well, not all of them were, but like I wasn't. I didn't care that much. But no, to be clear, it's not a pass. It's not a pass. I have so many games that when games are delayed, as long as they show up, I don't personally care. But there have been many people who are very upset at Portal Games, who have sworn never to back something from Portal Games again. This is definitely not the best uh, PR situation for Portal Games. They dove into crowdfunding with a few games. They had 11. Is that the soccer game? They've had the uh, 51st, uh, 51st State Master Set. I don't know what their plans are as far as coming back to crowdfunding. They've had campaigns since this as well. But I don't know how much they want to dive into that rabbit hole because the reality is that when you open up that process of making a game to consumer while well, seeing the entire thing from start to finish, that means normally if you make a game on the sidelines without any sort of crowdfunding, you make the game, whatever delays happen, happen, and no one's the wiser, no one cares. When you loop people into a process and a commitment, it totally changes the way things have to be done and it leaves you with expectations that sometimes you won't meet. And in the case of Robinson Crusoe, at least as far as timelines, those expectations weren't met. A lot of people have sworn off Portal Games. I'm sure some of those people have sworn off crowdfunding in general because they sat there and waited way too long to get a game that was a simple deluxification. I use the air quotes because nothing here is simple. Nothing here is anyway simple, and both things are true as we go through this video. And I should have said this at the very beginning, but first of all, this is not an invitation to go ahead and go after any any companies, to go into comment sections, to be aggressive and attack anyone. Uh, the reality is that some of these companies, especially as we go further down this list, have certainly done things that are problematic and or taking your money and or will never deliver a game. Some I don't think any of them with the intent to do that, but negligence is only a step away from maliciousness in this kind of conversation. It's not meant to be an excuse for any companies, but nor is this meant to be a rabble-rousing conversation where a bunch of people go out and do whatever kinds of things. The reality is that for all these companies, for all these times these things happen, it sucks. It's not fun. It's also generally not an excuse to be a horrible human being and or death threats, which sadly happen over board games. People have done bad things. Doesn't mean you need to do bad things back. 
With that, moving on to the next one over here, we're going to go move to the next one. Number nine is going to be Seven Citadel. Similar conversation. The only real difference here is that it's 33,000 people instead of 17,000 people. So the impact is doubled. But Seven Citadel and Robinson Crusoe, both games I backed, both games that have shown up, both games that I have... Well, I unboxed Robinson Crusoe. Seven Citadel, I didn't bother unboxing because honestly, I thought it would just be a whole lot of cards. But Seven Citadel, it's showing up. People are excited. People are seem to be mostly happy. I've seen like the usual mixed stuff I see around the Seventh Continent universe. Some people view it as a filing cabinet game where it's a little more tedious than they like. Others view it as an incredible experience. I honestly see both sides when it comes to these games. The Seventh Citadel from Sirius Bolt took way too long. And I remember, I remember when this campaign was announced, when they had this thing, let me see if I can see the uh, rewards over here. I remember when the campaign was announced, they had an estimate delivery of May 2022, and people lost their minds. People were like, that's crazy. That's so far out into the future. Why would we ever back this thing that's not coming for like two years? They didn't give the usual year timeline. They gave like a two-year timeline, which would be bad, except for the fact that it showed up in like February or March of 2024, two full years past the delivery date. I mean, this is one of the longest campaigns that has run. Not the longest campaign. In fact, honestly, something that should arguably be on this list, but I specifically didn't put it, is we're going to put an asterisk to the gambler's chest from Kingdom Death Monster. And that's like a seven-year campaign from process to delivery. Seven years, possibly the most insane thing I've ever seen. But for whatever reason, a lot of Kingdom Death fans are very patient and understanding and don't care as long as they get that end product. And they did get that end product. And so a lot of, I don't, I'm not fully involved in that community. I debated putting this one on the list because of the sheer scope and size of Kingdom Death Monster. The only reason it didn't is I just think that, um, I think almost all, if not every, I think almost all of those backers would be right back there for the next Kingdom Death Monster campaign. So I don't know if it hurt uh, consumer confidence and crowdfunding in any way past the uh, individual frustration of wanting your stuff sooner. So that speaks more to the fan base of Kingdom Death Monster in a arguably positive way, hard to really say when you have, I don't know, I don't know. Either way, Kingdom Death Monster was considered for this video. It is not in this video, but Seven Citadel was. A lot of people frustrated, a four year campaign. It's a four year process. By the time you got this game, who knows what happened? Who knows what your game group is like? I mean, the good news is you can play this game solo. Who knows if you're playing solo games? Who knows if you're interested in gaming at all? You may have got to know the hobby. The reality is the longer the period from when you back something to when it shows up, the more things can go wrong and it shows up and you just don't care anymore. You may have played dozens of games. You may have found yourself burnt out on the hobby. So many things can and do change in that time period, which makes this kind of delay just frankly not great. I am someone who tends to be fairly patient with these things. As long as they show up, I don't care. I got plenty of games to keep me busy. But even with myself, there are still games that show up and I'm like, you know what? I was excited about that three years ago. I'm just not excited today. Now, maybe if I play it, I will be excited. Maybe if I play it, I'll be like back to the excitement. But you lost me. It's been so long, I don't know or care anymore. And sometimes games just... They don't hook your attention once they show up, if they show up later than they should. So, uh, that's Seven Citadel, similar to Robinson Crusoe, same kind of general situation, just delays. I wish I could say the rest of this video were delays. The rest of this video is where we go, uh, get south very, very quickly. Because going on to the next eight of these, they're all campaigns that I hope will deliver. I have less confidence in some than others. And let's go ahead and go to the next one, which is number eight over here, is Adventures in Neverland. I remember when this campaign launched, 5,000 backers, this is Adventures of Neverland, a Peter Pan themed game, and it was such a, I remember one of the controversial things that happened during the campaign itself, is the company, not the designers, the company that was involved in this game or whatnot, they basically, I, if I recall correctly, this is a loose terminology, but I remember Tom Vassell had covered games in that company and thought they were so bad that doing their crowdfunding segment, their, um, uh, crowd, uh, the crowd surfing, crowd surfing. Uh, he basically was incredibly dismissive of like, I have no interest. I'll never try it. I'll never play it. Whatever. But he's incredibly dismissive of the game because of the company. Versus, I think uh, this is my rough, 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 rough recollection. And then people push back saying, hey, there's other designers involved. You're castigating these other designers who did nothing to do with those other games, and you're lumping them all together. That doesn't seem fair, and you're fairly harsh and aggressive. To the point that Tom Vassell put out an individual dedicated apology video saying, hey, you know what? You're right. I was unfairly harsh to new designers because of the company, and I will guarantee you a committed review whenever that game shows up. You know, you go ahead. I am here. I, I want to make good on it, and I, I can't because it's four years, and the game hasn't shown up and may never shown up, and based on the most recent updates, it's vaporware. It's the idea that they're still promising updates. They're still putting out updates. I still hope it's a thing, but like we're talking about like negotiation over playmats on the most recent update from like this past month or a month ago. And people still don't have pictures of the game. They have no production, no whatever. They're, this game might exist, but if it is, they're refusing to provide any evidence that it does exist. Adventures in Neverland, unfortunately, is in that category of like, again, like a game, a concept, a promise, a dream, an imagination, a dedicated review from Tom Vassell, and uh, all of that stuff is possibly never happening. 
I don't know. I don't know. Like this much time going by with a uh, this little degree of evidence that it exists is usually not a good look. The continued communication is because at the end of the day, one of the things to keep in mind is while continued communication with no real progress forward is incredibly frustrating as a backer, from the mindset of the person putting out those updates, if they have no intent of ever delivering it, what's the game plan? Put out an update every four months for the next 17 years? I, and I'm not in their minds. Maybe that is the game plan. I don't know. To me, in my own head, I'm like, as long as the updates are coming, there remains some degree of hope on their side that they can deliver. That's Maybe I'm just naive. Maybe I'm stupid. I don't know. But I think that I think that if I ever got to a point where, and if the intent wasn't there, let's say I ran a campaign, I meant the best, and everything was going great, and I got to a point where I just couldn't deliver, and I knew I wasn't going to deliver, I think I'd ghost you. Nothing personal, but like, what are my options? What are my options? I, well, I don't, I don't think I'd ghost you. I think I'd be direct with you, but hey, I'm really sorry. It sucks. I understand if you hate me, but it's not happening. Because at that point, at least get it all done with and move on with your life. You can't post a random update for the next 17 years. You're going to get the same hate. You're just extending the process. It's a band-aid. Pull it off and move on. But And it's not, it's not great. It's not what I'm recommending to anyone. But at least in my head, as long as updates continue to come, it means that the creator... This is my own imagination. It's not fact, but it means that the creator has some degree of hope that something is happening. Whether it's knowledge is happening, whether it's hope they can find an investor, it's still a process that is ongoing. Now, I have no idea what's going on behind the scenes in Adventures of Neverland. All I know is this, it's been quite some time. It's been quite some time. It's been four years. And from what we can see, the game doesn't really exist. So, uh, not great. Moving on to number seven over here. Number seven, Rally Man Dirt. Now, this is where we start getting into interesting interspersing. Like I said already, I rank this list in order of what I think is the most hurtful to the least hurt. Sorry, the least hurtful to the most hurtful in crowdfunding. But it's complicated because some campaigns are more egregious, but they have fewer backers. Some campaigns absolutely are not delivering, but again, they had less of an impact. So it's my own hierarchical tier of where I think are, where I think things are. But Holy Grail Games, as a company that has shuttered its doors and basically said that they're not delivering, you know, Rally Man Dirt, they're not delivering whatever the new one was. Oh my gosh, the most recent campaign, uh, I forgot the name of it, but the, whatever the most recent campaign they had was, Temple one, I don't remember. I, I covered it, but uh, unfortunately, I feel bad. I apologize, I'm sorry for that. Just, uh, it, yeah, it sucks. But uh, yeah, uh, Holy Grail Games, they closed their door. A bunch of good people in the company, from what I, I should rephrase that, people who I like, people who I enjoyed their interactions with, people who I believe had the best of intentions, and ultimately, best of intentions or not, it didn't work out. Was it Topin? Topin the Dying City? I think that was was. Maybe Cope in the Dying City? One of those two things. But anyways, it's not a defense of the people, to be very clear, nor is it a castigation of the people. I don't know what goes on behind the scenes. I don't know what happened. I don't know. I feel bad for everyone involved, from backers to creators. Obviously, the obligation is on the creator side. Let's make no mistake about that. It's their obligation. They're the ones who let you down. But... Holy Grail Games closed their doors, and uh, Rally Man Dirt. We have a bunch of people who are still trying to get their copy. I got a, I got a copy from a backer, uh, from, a, from a sorry, from a subscriber who sent me a copy that was a retail copy. I still back this game. Still haven't received my all in. Likely never will. They have this whole uh, warehouse where they're possibly doing stuff if you pay. I don't know the situation. I don't know if I'll ever see the game past the retail copy I have. And I kind of lost a little bit of interest in it because I was like, now it represents that that bad taste in your mouth. And so ultimately. This, again, whenever a company closes its doors, whenever a company has multiple campaigns going on and they close their doors, it's not good. It's not good for crowdfunding. It's not good for consumer confidence. It's not good for that excitement of these projects you're going to get one day. It's more about like, okay, well, is this one going to deliver or not? Is this one I should just wait for retail? Sure, I can save money if it shows up. These things aren't good for crowdfunding. They're not good for consumer confidence. And the multiple campaigns that Holy Grail Games left undelivered, it's a shame. It's a shame. And they have Encyclopedia, one of my favorite games. Encyclopedia. I adore Encyclopedia. I think it's great. I believe there were expansion plans in the works, and I hope we see an expansion one day. I want to see more for that game. But honestly, between the more mixed reception, as much as I love it, not everyone has loved it quite as much. It's been very mixed. Like, some people are really there right with me on Encyclopedia, and others are like, I don't get it. It's not fun. And it definitely seen mixed reviews in that one. But that means that between the mixed coverage, between the company behind it, I don't know if we'll ever see an expansion. I hope we do, but uh, the whole situation sucks, and uh, Holy Grail Games is our number six. Our number 10, 9, 8, 7, our number seven. Coming in number six, we have Village Attacks, Grim Dynasty, specifically Grim Lord Games. Grim Lord Games left, well, kind of a few things outstanding. They primarily left Village Attacks, Grim Dynasty outstanding. That was the campaign that didn't deliver. The Everrain before it, there are still people who didn't get it, but it seems to have mostly been delivered. Like, I got the Everrain, I did, I did a whole unboxing for it, I got flack for the unboxing, I get that. It's one of those complicated things of, when are you showcasing a game versus when are you promoting the company? And that's complicated and sucks, and I get anyone who's frustrated with that. But uh, the Village Attacks in general, this one is definitely did not deliver. They do have 
somebody else pick up the campaign or bought the rights and they're, I believe, released print and play assets or TTS assets or something like that. But ultimately, I believe they are going to be coming back to crowdfunding as a different company that has to charge you entirely anew for those games. Because sometimes when companies pick up these games, these titles, they, they do agree to some form of commitment of giving you something. Although sometimes they get flack for that too. When Simon did it for um, Mythic Games and they picked up one of their games and said, hey, we're going to deliver hell and... Anastir, I think those are the two. We're delivering Helen Anastir, but we are, uh, you know, going to give you just a base copy. People gave Simon a lot of flack for that, which I think is, as much as you hate Simon for this, that, or the other, honestly, I think you should be grateful for someone stepping in and taking it up, because many times you have situations like this with Grimlord Games, where you just can't do so, where you just can't afford to make all these games for people that you never got the money for. You never got the money for, you're just buying the assets to hopefully bring this project to life. But again, Grimlord Games, Regardless of the intent, I think it's another company that their failure across multiple campaigns-ish, again, it's mostly village attacks, but then some degree of leftover from the Everain, definitely not a good look in terms of any consumer confidence in the crowdfunding space or these big box campaigns, especially when you're deciding whether you need another big box campaign or not, and you're like, hey, you know what? I have 17 copies of Zombicide. Do I really need another miniatures, heroes, and all that? And sometimes the answer is, I still want it, but what if I don't even get it? Coming in at number five, we have Chai T for two. This one is arguably more more egregious in the overall communication that should be higher up the list in terms of how bad it is uh, but the scope and scale of it is smaller than some of the larger campaigns or companies we'll be talking about soon so chai t for two gets our number five spot could be better could be worse well the communication could not be worse but the rest of it could be worse chai t for two and i feel bad with this one too because i remember the first time there were any rumors at all about, hey, this issue with Chai Tifa 2, I remember being one of the naysayers. I remember being like, hey, guys, it's been such a short amount of time. You're talking about a marginal delay in updates. I've seen so much stuff in the crowdfunding space that is so much worse than what you're talking about, and those things are totally fine. This is a minor blip. Why is everyone overreacting? That was my reaction. I was wrong. I was absolutely wrong. Now, it's complicated because I still stand by the aspect that I said where I do believe that at the time, the, the voices, there was a lot of rabble-rousing without a lot of actual concern for it. But at the end of the day, in this case, that concern was correct because Chai T for Two is another campaign that we don't know when it will or won't show up. This is a 2021 crowdfunding campaign, and it may eventually show up. I have no idea if it will. I have no idea when it will. I don't know the situation. Honestly, Chai TV2, uh, so the Kedan uh, and Connie Casimir, they make some great dice trays that I still, to this day, think are the best dice trays in the business. And it sucks, because I can't even like recommend or promote those in any way, shape, or form, because I don't want to send anyone this direction. Like It's... it's the degree of communication, and I get it, part of the problem as well is, we talk about this in general, don't go to the campaigns, don't be a tool, don't be whatever, which is complicated, because like, you're like, what are my options? They took money from me, they're not delivering the game, I'm not gonna, like, I can't sue them, so like, at the very least, I'm entitled to a harshly worded comment on the crowdfunding campaign page. And frankly, you are. The only problem is, it's not gonna help you, it's not gonna do anything, and there's a difference between a harshly worded comment and an aggressively attacking comment, and some people pursue the aggressively attacking comment, which, while I am understanding where it comes from, it doesn't actually help the situation. It's still not the right response or approach, so it's just kind of like an outlet for your frustration that doesn't really help or do anything positive. But again, your frustration is reasonable. That's that's on them. How you react to that frustration is on you. But uh, the reality over here are things like Chai T for Two, I know for their for their mental health, they've stayed away from the updates. They've had other people look at them. They don't read or look at the comments. And I understand that. I genuinely do. At a certain point, if you have 5,000 people who are aggressively upset at you for your incredible lack of communication, for your incredible lack of respect for the money you took from people, for your lack of like a genuine degree of apology and ownership for what you've done, intentional or not, own your actions. Own your actions. doesn't mean that, again... Intentional or not, own your actions. So I understand every single person frustrated with them, and then the re net reaction to that is they're like, okay, well, why should we go onto a page where the only thing that's going to happen is we're just going to get worse into the muck? And I honestly, hate to say this, I think it's a reasonable choice. It doesn't mean that they have any lack of accountability for actually delivering this game, which may or may not happen, I don't know. But uh, right now, it's again, it's in that vaporware category. It's a thing that might happen. It may show up. It genuinely might show up. I just don't know what that process looks like, and uh, it's incredibly disrespectful to backers the way that the things and the communication is being handled. Like, there really needs to be a degree, actually. Let me check if there's any recent updates on this one. I didn't even look. We have a November 18, 2023 update. That's the last one, so um, not much there. It's been a while. It's been a while. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised there's not more comments on this page. Yeah, it's it's not even fun anymore to vent out my frustration. One quick update is that we should be have backers receiving the games in January. The whole campaign is just plain sad. Today's the perfect day for an update. Yeah, this is like... This is not... Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, we can at least rest easy knowing our games weren't on the boat that took out the bridge in Baltimore. I guess there's some some silver lining. It sucks. The whole situation sucks. I, I, I feel incredibly bad for the backers and this kind of garbage, especially with a lighter game. Honestly, to a certain extent, Chai Tifa 2 might be should be higher on this list because even though the full backer count affected is smaller, it's also a lot of people who are probably, I mean, the ratio I'd say of likely people who are diving to crowdfunding with less of a knowledge of the space is likely higher in here, which means those people are going to be affected more by this single failure, possible single failure. It might be the only campaign someone backed. So Chai Tifa 2, definitely a game that hurt crowdfunding. Moving on to number four, we have Storm Thunder Heirs of Rune. This is a... Uh, this is a fun one. And this is Lazy Squire Games. Lazy Squire Games, they also have Wild Descent, Levon Rising over on GameFound. So again, GameFound as well. But basically, Storm Thunder, Heirs of Ruin from Lazy Squire Games. And I want to be very clear here about my biases. I love Wild Descent, genuinely. I like the team at Lazy Squire Games, genuinely. I think they're fun. I think they communicate pretty decently. I like them on a personal level. I even like their, I like their campaigns. I genuinely like everyone there. None of that takes away from the fact that they're idea of their campaigns is basically signing up for a guessing game and the hope for the optimistic that things will show up. Now I remember feeling this about the original Wild Descent. When I first backed the original Wild Descent and then like two and a half, three years later, it was like, I was like, where is this thing? Where is this game? Is, like, is it showing up ever? I remember that pessimism definitely entered my, my, I don't know, my mind. It was the Ever Rain and Wild Descent were my two most outstanding campaigns for a while. No longer at this point. We have other campaigns. Both those have delivered. But then Wild Descent showed up and I loved Wild Descent and I, I became much more of an advocate for Lazy Squire games, and to a certain extent, I still am. I think the games they make are great. I know the people who got their hands on Storm Sunder, and they said incredibly positive things about the game. It's an ambitious system that is likely going to be incredibly rewarding if you ever get your hands on it. And I don't know what the chance percent, I don't know what the percentage chances are on that. I don't know if this is a game that you're definitely never going to see, or a game that you're definitely going to see. I don't know where it is. I know that I personally am still optimistic that it'll show up. This is not an excuse to go ahead and back more. I think you can still late pledge these games. This is not an excuse to go ahead and late pledge them. I think that I am optimistic. I could be wrong. I could be stupid. Again, see previous comments around Chai Tifa 2. But I guess the difference here is anyone who's not optimistic, I get it. Anyone who thinks this game will never show up, I get that. For whatever reason, I remain stupidly optimistic that it actually is going to show up. And again, goes some of that goes back to the way they communicate, the updates they have, the talk of continued playtesting. I think this is just a nightmare in the delay world of things. I don't know what's going to go on as far as, I don't know what their finances or budgeting or production looks like. So a lot of things I just don't know. And the longer campaigns like this go on, the more you're just sucking up money that you can't afford to pay anyone. How are you actually going to make the thing a thing? How are you going to do that? I don't know their plans. I haven't reached out to them to talk about like what the actual situation is. All I know is if the game does show up, I'll be incredibly excited. If the game doesn't show up, I'll be like $800 in the hole. Uh, and, and so will a lot of other people will be like, it's it's a lot of money for this game. I was very excited for this one. These big giant box projects. I mean, we could even talk about Madara. Madara did not make this list over here, but they had a three part campaign where part one delivered and then parts two and three are like, hey, one day, one day they'll show up. We'll see how this one goes. So yeah, Storm Thunder, Heirs of Rune, as well as uh, Wild Ascent, uh, Levon Rising. Both of them, one of them is a fantastic game that I've played. The other one is a game that is theoretically fantastic that I hope to play. And both of them are games that, as of right now, are in the imagination of maybe. We'll see. But the delays in this one are a big deal. The, the amount of, uh, of just constant not happening. Like, I hope they show up. I hope they happen. I hope I'm not being optimistic for no reason at all. But we'll see. Storm Thunder is our number three. Lazy Squire games in general. Our number two, on the other hand, if I can find this tab, or number three, so I think I'm up to number three, is Return to Planet Apocalypse. Sandy Peterson over here. This is specifically Peterson Games. Uh, this is because of the scope and scale of the amount of different campaigns that were there. I think there's actually a little bit less upsetness around this one in general. At least I see less upsetness, but it might be because I'm not a backer on these campaigns. But Peterson Games kind of had a bunch of ongoing campaigns, had a very successful company, and then one day said, hey, turns out we mostly have a successful company. But we also have a lot of campaigns that you may or may not ever see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what happens. We're going to continue to sell our stuff and hope that we can then continue slowly delivering. And that's something that they have been doing, to their credit. They have been in some way delivering some of their campaigns. Although, again, to be full transparency, I don't know all the updates on all their games. So I can't tell you about like where everything is at every given point. I've, been, I've read a few of them here and there. But I don't know all the stuff going on with every one of them, but they have a bunch of campaigns that are just massively delayed. This is one of those large companies that had a bunch of cascading campaigns, and then eventually they sat there and said, hey, by the way, all those things in the mix, they aren't necessarily happening the way you thought they were. And that is in particular, I think, one of the big 
crowdfunding issues is when you have these companies that are running multiple campaigns. And I think as a successful company, you kind of have to. Everyone expresses this concern about Simon all the time. Like, well, what happens? They have like seven campaigns in the queue. Yeah, they also are a huge company and it's worked out fine until then. The problem is my calm, flippant reassurance, which is totally genuine to the way a company works. You're allowed to have multiple products in a, you're allowed to have multiple games in your life cycle at any given point that it makes sense. The problem is, while it does make sense and while it is totally okay, whenever one of those companies fails, it's a reminder to everyone else, you see, we were right. We were right. We should have been afraid. Every company that has seven campaigns in the queue should be a problem. When the reality is it shouldn't be a problem, most of those companies are doing just fine and will continue to do just fine. But then you have those one or two outliers that are unfortunately a giant reminder to people that you're now part of of their seven campaigns. Because when you have Fantasy Flight, who has who knows how many products in queue at any given point, uh, it doesn't make a difference because they're Fantasy Flight and they're not taking your money until they sell you the product. When a company takes your, your, your money before that product comes to life, it means that it's now your money being risked. It's not their money. It's your money being risked on that giant life cycle. And it's a reminder that you should possibly consider not backing seven campaigns from one company. doesn't matter how much you like Zombicide. Maybe you should just back every third Zombicide instead of every other one. You're still going to run out of space no matter what happens anyways. And the Dead Keep is like a version of Zombicide. Anyways, that's what we have for Return to Planet Apocalypse over here. It's the Dead Keep's more than a version of Zombicide. I have a full review. You can check it out. Anyways, we have Peterson Games for number three. And our number two is going to be Blacklist Games. Blacklist Games, again, another company that had a bunch of things in the pipeline. Another company that I remember way back when with Street Masters... Which one? Bl um, Aftershock. Street Masters Aftershock was the first Blacklist Games that I personally backed. And it's a game that... I remember when it was being delivered, there were so many excuses and issues and delays with like a handful of stuff. Most people got their stuff, but like 20 some people didn't. And again, going back to my own being wrongness, which happens, uh, I remember a whole bunch of people being concerned that Blacklist Games was going belly up, expressing concern over their finances, over the transparency, over the issues. And I remember getting my pledge eventually. I, I was one of the later ones. And I was like, you see, I got it. It is a thing. Like it's, even though I was bothered by it, it's still showing up. It's all fine. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of people thinking things are going wrong, and everything's all fine. Until one day it wasn't. Because one day it wasn't. One day it was not fine. Everything kind of collapsed into them. They had a whole bunch of campaigns, and eventually they sat there and said, by the way, we've been doing this thing, and it's not working out. We're not actually successfully making our way forward, and that's when things slowly started to shudder. And there are lots of campaigns, I believe. I did Blacklist Series games. Did Blacklist Series 2 ever even deliver? I'm 90% sure I backed that, and I don't think I ever got it, so I'm pretty sure it didn't deliver. But in general, Blacklist Games, they had campaign after campaign. They branched out into miniatures, which at a great price point, which turns out may not have been a sustainable price point. And again, I don't think it's malice. I think it's negligence. I think it's not being run correctly, not understanding the proper cost and attribution. There's a reason these campaigns were so cheap in some cases, and it left a lot of people spending a lot of money on something that they wanted to get their hands on, but then never did or did with massive delays, or eventually someone else took it over. I know uh, Steamforge Games taking over a bunch of their things, Colossal Games taking over a few other things. Their campaigns have basically been shuttered from pump company to company. Uh, the Save the Brothers finally started working with Steamforge Games on new Street Masters content. Blacklist Games made a bunch of great products and then failed completely in the delivery of those products once campaign upon campaign, once stacking those campaigns didn't work out for them. And unfortunately, the temptation is there. They still have, what is it? They have um, the horror series, whatever it is, Un... Not on something. I think it's on something. I don't remember what it was. They have they have so many games, so many games, and some really solid games too. I've played some of their games. I've liked their games. They have that you know, that football game that I really liked. I had a fantasy football miniature game. Had a chance to play it on TTS. It was the last campaign before they just canceled and said, "Hey, it's not happening." I really liked that game. I thought it was very solid, and it's uh, not there. But that's honestly less offensive than the ones that were sold and never actually delivered. So Blacklist Games had a had a good thing going. Had a loyal audience, and they kind of ruined that. To again, not necessarily anything other than this negligence, but the net result is still the same. And lastly, and I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, the name that is right now most associated with uh, crowdfunding problems is Mythic Games. I have Anastir up on the page, but really it's anything Mythic Games. Uh, whether it's Hell the Lost Saga, Anastir, both of which have now been taken over by Simon. By, by we have, um, what are the campaigns that didn't deliver? We have Monster Apocalypse, which we have no real news on. Six Siege finally is delivering. Darkest Dungeon still has their whole Wave 2 issues. Uh, in general, Mythic Games had a lot of campaigns. They ran, ran these campaigns back to back. They continue to try to grow the company and get themselves out of this pit. But behind it all, there was a problem happening. Behind it all, there was a lack of funds and using one project's funds to pay the next one. And that came to fruition when you have, or came to pass, or however it is, it came, the whole thing came, uh, came unraveled 
the whole thread unraveled after Six Siege and Darkest Dungeon when they started asking people for a lot more money, wave after wave of repeated shipping to pay for things and to pay for things again and to pay for things again to get your products. And that resulted in a complete lack of confidence in Mythic Games. A, a definitely a lot of people who are concerned anytime you have a company who's going campaign to campaign. Again, going back to Simon as an example, the amount of times I see people saying, oh, we don't want Simon to be the next Mythic Games. Well, no one does. I don't think they will be, but it's not a guarantee. The harsh reality is that, again, you are being sucked into someone else's product life cycle. You are paying money for someone else to deliver these products, and you are hopefully getting a product, but in the case of some of these titles, in the case of things like Anister, you have people who've paid hundreds of dollars to get their hands on all-ins, multiple all-ins in some cases, and uh, Simon's taking over and they're giving you a core pledge for free. Which, grats to Simon, like, good for them, but also that leaves Mythic Games basically abandoning any form of what they owe you, because they're like, hey, uh, it is what it is, we aren't going to be able to deliver this, and so we're passing the buck to somebody else who will be able to do something, but you're still left out of hundreds of dollars of crowdfunding funds. And again, I'm a backer of some of these campaigns. I'm right there with you on some of these. Some of these have backed, some of them not, but I've. it's the same position. Mythic Games is easily the company that is the most associated with any degree of lack of consumer confidence in crowdfunding. And before we end this video, I don't want to end it on all doom and gloom. The reality is that most games you back are still safe. Tabletop, the tabletop category still has one of the highest degrees of safety, like safety records, or whatever it is, in terms of their their consistency in delivering in crowdfunding compared to things like tech or who know or video games, any of that stuff. Tabletop is still one of the safest categories in crowdfunding, and most of your campaigns will still deliver. I have backed hundreds of campaigns, and I have a handful, like two or three, that haven't delivered. I have like Chai Tifa Two, uh, Rally Man Dirt and then a bunch of Mythic games. I think that, oh, and then <laughs> the uh, fantasy series, whatever not. Out of hundreds of campaigns, hundreds and hundreds of campaigns that I've backed over the years, for the most part, crowdfunding is still a safe place to put your money, so to speak. But it's still a risk. And it still means you have to be mindful what you back and what you're okay with. Never spend money on something that's coming a year and a half from now if you're not okay with losing that money. Because the harsh reality is that losing your money is always a real possibility in these conversations as much as it sucks to do so. Anyways, that's your uh, depressing video for the day. 10 campaigns or companies that hurt consumer confidence in crowdfunding. Take some of the magic out of the space. And there can be so much magic in the space. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.